painting might be as simple as just the way paint is put on. Paint can be applied anyway, sometimes frankly and flatly, as if the surface didn't mean anything. Or, which is what these paintings by Mark Rothko are doing, so a sort of breathing surface is the main theme, the main effect by which the painting is able to convey its message. Rothko was a New Yorker whose family immigrated from Russia when he was a child. Until middle age, he was unsuccessful and poor. He sympathised with the revolutionary political movements in the USA in those times. He lived an isolated existence. He was unstable. And so when success came to him in the 1950s, its suddenness was overwhelming. The paintings we were just looking at were done by him in the late 50s as a commission for the new Seagram building for their exclusive restaurant on the top floor called the Four Seasons. But having painted them, he became furious at the idea of rich bastards, as he called them, eating in front of his work. Ten years later, he gave the paintings away, free, to what was then the Tate Gallery. He was fanatic about how they should be displayed. The lighting and spacing, even today, is exactly as Rothko wanted. By grim coincidence, he died on the day they arrived in Britain. Rothko committed suicide and his paintings don't depict anything. So it's only natural, in a way, that we should wish that death might be what they're communicating. I don't personally think that. That's a human tragedy. But the meaning of the paintings is different to that. Profound visual lift. That's the same meaning that a cathedral has, or the inside of an Egyptian tomb or a Greek temple. Death is part of those things as well but in such a universal sense that it's as if the marvel of the whole of existence, not just its termination point, is being celebrated. Death as part of some kind of gigantic cosmic unity. Rather than getting carried away with the, what has become over the years a sort of rhetoric of heavy breathing emotion, let's try instead to understand what these paintings actually are and how they work. That sense of a surface that is active and expressive gets more and more insistent as you look. Grey is applied lightly, like a mist, diffused, so the surface becomes cloudy, not sheer, animated, not still or inert. The painting as a whole is created in terms of misty breakups and stuttering breakups, and then passages that are all about merging and flowing. So, if the feeling is, well, it's all dark or it's all red, the experience of darkness and redness is a nuanced one. A simple colour theme of blackish red is elaborated and celebrated so that the whole of existence is celebrated. The room is a sort of pharaoh's tomb. In his control freakery, he's a megalomaniac like the pharaohs. He's the pharaoh and the pharaoh's decorator in a Rothko-centric universe. He's the architect, the painter and the philosopher-priest. All that pretentiousness would be off-putting if it weren't for the rule of painterly transformation that is the true interest of this abstract art. 
the quality of surprise in the treatment of a surface so that looming darkness is alive with energy. The rule that colours place next to each other will always suggest depth, different positions in space, was exciting to artists like Paul Clay and Mark Rothko, and has been followed by Albert Irvin, who's now 92, for 50 years. Yeah, I'll put it... So you put it down in front of those tins. Yeah, that's it. And drop it onto the... Yeah. Okay. Onto the back two. Okay. And put those under. Oh, God, it's nice to have somebody helping. Well, I'd yeah. better come and be your assistant. It's a real luxury. <laughs> They're, they're abstract paintings, but they're informed by my movement through the world. Those marks seem sort of structural, and, and they have their own life as events. Yeah. Structural in terms of the whole unity, and they have their own personality. Yes. I'd like to, I'd like to think so. They, you know, insofar as... Painting is a language. I think the brush marks are the verbs. Although that was, you can probably analyse that out of extinction if you wanted to. No, I think painting as a language is a good idea. <laughs> and the brush marks as verbs is a good idea. There are things behind things. Mm. You know, like in the space of the studio. Now, if I look across uh, the room, you're standing in front of the wall. Yeah. So it's those uh, sort of perceptions. I, I understand completely what you're saying, Bert. It's as if reality itself is layered. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing that you're looking for in the painting. Yes. Yeah. But you're doing it through colour. Yes. Yeah. Through a rather pure colour. When I first started painting abstract paintings, I used to use very sombre colours. I, I had the idea that... Uh, uh, an important painting had to be a dark earth colours. The horrible thing is washing all these brushes. I bet. <laughs> the visual impressiveness of abstract art from the 1950s and 1910s is carried on by abstract art now, but often not with the old sense of abstract purity. Here's some abstract art that's full of glinting reflections. It's by the Ghanaian artist El Anatsui. Unlike artists who work on a flat canvas and do create patterns, the visual complexity of which must be structured into the object, El Anatsui allows his work to behave like textiles. And the shadow and light created by the drapery creates an additional focus for what you're looking at and is part of the thought process involved in the making. <laughs> It's a lesson in setting up meaning. Meaning of a simpler, less philosophical kind than the early abstract artists went in for. He offers a jigsaw of meanings that are abstract but easily readable. Its structure imitates a traditional Ghanaian fabric called kente cloth, woven for centuries by labour-intensive processes, so the visual effect is very rich. Kente cloth is a source of national pride. If history is in the picture, then the history of colonialism must be in there too, with all its human wretchedness. And the materials Elan Atsui uses suggest waste and squalor. work of abstract art made of bottleneck wrappers, the bits of metal foil that go round the neck of a 
whiskey bottle or a gin bottle. Rubbish, really, scavenged from the street. He makes it look like gold, but it's old bits of foil. It's rubbish that reads as gold. So there's ambiguity or a double meaning. Baseness that can be transformed into gold, with gold as the good thing. But also, baseness might be indistinguishable from or interchangeable with gold. So gold's shimmer, its attractiveness, is untrustworthy. It always depends where you stand in relation to it as to whether or not gold does shimmer. So maybe the impression of gold here is a metaphor for delusion. The pioneer abstract artists a hundred years ago thought abstract values were the path to truth. They took out any meanings to do with history, society, nationhood. Those are the meanings El Anatsui builds in. He presents you with a powerful visual blast accompanied by questions about what power might mean. Today all art competes in a market and purely abstract art is relatively rare. Abstract art that has clues about easily gettable meaning is preferred. 29 million, 30 million, 31 million. Abstract art of the past gets huge prices today. 77 million five and selling. That much for a Rothko. Not because he's subtle about red and black, but because his high status name is synonymous with fabulous success. Money is never really the point. Rothko's predecessor, Hilma F. Klimt, said W is material, U is spiritual. She really did believe what she was doing could alter the world. If there's a rule of early abstract art as a whole, it is that it was incredibly optimistic. So the rule of optimism passing on is the rule I'm now going to sign off with, with a work by an artist who was born the same year that Hilmar F. Klint went up to the spirits in the sky. Here's a kind of abstract art that is unequivocally visually amazing, but open-ended as to whom that amazement is for and where it's coming from. It's partly sinister because it's about wealth and we live in a time when wealth is sinister. And it's partly optimistic because wealth is referred to by rubbish, old bits of thrown away metal foil. So wealth's mystique is removed, its intimidation is removed, we can see through it. But we're still getting the pleasure and with that pleasure a sense of a different kind of wealth, the wealth of ideas as art processes contradictions. Matthew Collings reveals how to decipher works by some of the greatest abstract artists at bbc.co.uk slash your paintings. And he'll be hosting a live panel at the Tate Modern asking what is abstract art, broadcast on Free Thinking on Radio 3 next Wednesday. Tomorrow here on BBC4, architect Zahar Hadid profiles one of her great influences, Russian revolutionary at 10.